So thank you very much for that introduction, Jonathan. Uh, as we heard earlier today, this talk is actually going to kind of bridge the first section and also allude to topics that we'll be hearing later today as well as tomorrow. So we've heard that, uh, as we see on the right side of the screen, that um, chronic conditions are very common in older adults and that over two thirds of older adults have two or more chronic conditions. And you can see there's a wide variety. So it's gonna link in to uh, what we're gonna hear about uh, organ function and what uh, Dr. Kushal had shared with us about organ function, where we see uh, many common conditions. These common conditions are often treated with pharmaceutical agents. And we've heard a number of, of different proportions, uh, both from Jonathan and in a first panel, that at least 30% of older adults in the US are taking five or more prescription medications. But a real concern around that are the adverse drug reactions. They are prevalent with four or more hospitalizations per thousand person years. Drug, adverse drug reactions are serious. They're among the top 10 causes of death and adverse drug reactions are expensive. Annual cost estimates range between 30 billion to $180 billion. So we've also heard in the first section how older adults are underrepresented in trials. And this is a real concern because Medicare beneficiaries differ significantly from trial participants. And yet those same trials are used to inform Medicare coverage decisions. And as we heard earlier, that we often are not seeing in our leading publications that clinical trial results are rarely stratified by age, sex, or race. So here's a, a figure from the archives of internal medicine showing on the, the right in the black bars, the average age of the Medicare beneficiaries or uh, the older proportion of them. And then we can see in the mean age uh, from participants in a variety of technology assessment. And so we can see, uh, here's another kind of view um, that uh, Dr. Bernard had shared about uh, disease specific, and this is about uh, different sorts of approaches. Um, we have panelists that are experts in oncology and JAMA recently had a paper about older adults still being left out of cancer clinical trials. And we, we uh, this was touched upon in the first section. And it's not necessarily uh, age as a restriction anymore but it's those comorbid conditions. And when you have over two thirds of older adults, those over 65 with two or more chronic conditions, this already has diminished your, your sample that you, you your eligible sample. Um, also organ dysfunction, we'll be hearing more about that soon. Prior malignancies, if you're an older adult, you've had more time at risk. So that's very likely you may have had a prior malignancy. There's also exclusion criteria that are not really related or have little bearing on the treatment that's being studied. And we heard about this earlier, concurrent medications. We know if you have many comorbidities, it's highly likely that you're taking multiple medications. There are also exclusion criteria on hearing, vision, mobility, impairments, and a number of factors that may not be related to the agent under study. So what can we do? We're not here just to tell you about all the problems because I'm sure all of you can list quite a few problems. But we can really require, as we heard earlier and that uh, Dr. Bernard was sharing that the review panels for uh, have been really focused on is really strong justification for exclusion criteria. We also heard about um, and I think that we need, really need to encourage clinical trials specific to older adults through targeted federal funding. This has worked well in pediatrics and we just heard about that. We know that there's many diseases very specific to older adults and they, they are uh, recruiting dementias and many uh, conditions are very specific to older adults. So this is possible and not your leaf zig did uh, point out some of the major advances in clinical trials that were specific to older adults. 
we need to really be uh, publicizing these trends and in inclusion of older adults so we can really see, are we progressing? And that may also help us start to find out where the barriers are. And I think something that could be uh, a very strong incentive and has uh, also been uh, suggested as a strong incentive is really requiring that direct evidence of benefit of a pharmaceutical or a device when making national coverage determinations uh, for services for Medicare beneficiaries. Because we saw earlier in the first uh, panel that not all drugs show that same efficacy or benefit in adults. So what can we really be doing? So design should really produce relevant and generalizable results for older comorbid adults, as well as all older adults. And that's really by including the patients that can, clinicians are caring for in routine practice. So I think one of the things that was brought up in the first panel was the real challenge of getting older adults to want to be in placebo controlled trials and that reliance on that traditional parallel group randomized controlled trial uh, has, has been the standard, our gold standard for information, but maybe it's time to really be considering alternative designs such as adaptive platform designs. Um, in the afternoon, we're going to be hearing about these advanced designs, but just as a little uh, teaser, so you, you tune back in, these are studies, uh, designs, that you can have multiple interventions for a disease or a condition, and it's in a perpetual manner where interventions may enter or leave the platform, and that's based on predefined decision criteria. So are these used? Yes, they're currently used mostly in phase two trials. They're accepted by the FDA. We may hear more about that later. Of this family of adaptive trials, there is the randomized embedded multifactorial adaptive platform, don't say that too fast, or REMAP trial. And these are, remember, we're trying to make trials so we can have actual patients in clinical practices engaged in clinical research. And so these are designs embedded in clinical practice to lever efficiencies in trial execution and to provide a continual updated randomized evidence of best practices because we really would like learning health systems to best take care of all, all patients. There's numerous advantages to pharmaceutical and device development as well as comparative effectiveness. And that will really help bridge that knowledge transition gap that we, we heard in the, the first uh, panels of really how long it takes to get from uh, clinical investigation into clinical practice. And so there are trial designs that may shorten that timeline. And we should think about outcomes. We were hearing in the first panel that older adults may have outcomes that are not just organ-specific endpoints or mortality endpoints. And we really should be including, maybe not as a primary outcome, but we should be recording outcomes relevant to older adults. And we'll be hearing more about that from panelists um, uh, later today and tomorrow. And the International Consortium for Health Outcomes and Measurements did extensive work and have a very thorough report. And I list just some of the topics here that were the top uh, outcomes that are relevant for older adults. And they're often trying to engage their uh, care providers in how is their treatment going to affect their activities of daily living, their frailty status. They don't want polypharmacy. They don't like taking a lot of drugs, care, Carer burden. Hi, uh, Heather. Just giving you your two minute warning. Great. Thank you. So, what are our challenges? Well, pharmaceutical companies follow the design and analysis guidance of the FDA, and they have to be risk averse about including high risk older adults. And there's really a disconnect about who covers costs. Pharmaceutical companies cover the cost of drug development, which is very expensive while taxpayers and insurers cover the cost of adverse drug reactions. 
The FDA requires outcomes that are disconnected from the priorities of older adults. They don't have to be the primary outcomes, but we certainly should know how drugs affect outcomes that are important to older adults. And we don't really know whether a drug acts similarly when taken with two, five, or 10 or more drugs. So in summary, if we continue to conduct traditional clinical trials, by excluding older adults, possibly on all sorts of other criteria other than age, these are our greatest users of medications. Then we will continue to have unacceptably high levels of adverse drug reactions. We're going to have taxpayers and insurers cover increased costs from adverse drug reactions. We're gonna have uninformed clinical decision-making for older adults, and we're going to be unable to address outcomes that matter most to older adults. But by considering modern trial designs, and we'll be hearing more about specific um, styles later in the day, where participants reflect the population with the disease, and we can measure relevant outcomes, we can address these deficits. And if we continue to publicize the trends of inclusion of older adults in clinical trials, as well as sex and race, and other major characteristics that are important for clinicians to work with their patients, then we can be assessing our progress in improving the generalizability of research. And here is my listing of references, and I turn it back to our monitor, uh, moderator, Jonathan. Thank you.